Hello, uh, good morning everybody, thank you for joining us. Um, today, uh, well, in the last few webinars, we've looked through a number of the different CMSIS standards, or the Cortex microcontroller software interface standard, and these are a number of specifications that try to make C code portable uh, between different tool chains and, to a certain extent, between different microcontrollers. Today, I'd like to have a look at the CMSIS DSP library. Uh, this is a, a library, a source code library that was developed by ARM and is provided open source um, so that you can download it free of charge from their website. It's also integrated into the Kyle tools uh, as a standard library and it contains a collection of DSP or common DSP algorithms uh, that we're likely to need uh, if we're uh, developing uh, any kind of DSP application on a, a Cortex microcontroller. So in total there are about 61 different functions uh, from basic math, statistics, fast maths, uh, various filtering and transform applications, so generally all the sorts of things that we need uh, to create useful DSP applications. Uh, there are a number of versions of each function that are customized for different data types. So we can go from a, a, an 8-bit uh, DSP application through 16, 32-bit, and also we have floating point algorithms as well. So again, it will probably match the most of your needs um, that you're likely to find in a, a general purpose uh, microcontroller application. Um, the DSP library uh, it can be run on any of the Cortex processors, uh, so an M0 up to an M7. However, the Cortex M4 and M7 have a number of extensions uh, that make them particularly suitable for DSP applications. Uh, the Cortex M4, I think, was introduced somewhere around 2008 and it extended the capabilities of the, um, uh, the Cortex-M3 um, to make what ARM really described as a digital signal controller. So we had a general purpose microcontroller architecture uh, with some extensions that also allowed you to uh, perform uh, DSP applications efficiently as well. So we could make a mixed application of uh, event-driven code and also real-time signal processing as well. So um, the Cortex-M4, if you've used an M3, really a Cortex-M4 is architecturally very similar and as a software programmer uh, you wouldn't really notice the difference moving in from an M3 to an M4. Yeah, it's essentially the, the same thing uh, when you look at it from a high level. However, it does introduce a number of key features uh, that really uh, improve its maths and um, uh, DSP performance. Um, the first one of these is a hardware floating point unit, so this is a single precision floating point unit uh, that vastly accelerates the uh, ability of the device to do floating point maths. Uh, also within the instruction set uh, that's expanded to include a number of additional instructions uh, to support DSP applications. Uh, Apart from that, any tools or code that you have uh, that you've used on a Cortex-M3, uh, really you can take straight onto a, a Cortex-M4. So the, the floating point processor uh, supports uh, IEEE uh, 754. Um, it's tightly coupled into the C compiler, um, so we just have to tell the tool chain that we're, we have a floating point unit and code will automatically be generated to take care of the floating point unit. Uh, then um, we're doing all of our floating point in hardware, so we're getting things like single cycle multiply, single cycle add and subtract, so a, a vast improvement uh, in floating point maths. Uh, when we actually look at um, DSP uh, algorithms, uh, we can really see that they are dominated by multiply accumulate instructions. So whether we're doing filtering, uh, transforms like FFT or correlation, uh, we're doing lots and lots of multiplies and accumulates, uh, typically on pipelines of, of data. So within the uh, 
Cortex M4 and M7 instruction set, we have a set of SIMMED instructions, so single instruction, multiple data. So these instructions allow us to take 32-bit words and we can pack them with 8 or 16-bit data and then in one cycle with a single instruction uh, we can perform uh, multiple calculations. So in, in the case below we're doing uh, two multiplies, two 16-bit multiplies and accumulate. So if we have a pipeline of data, uh, we can chew through it really twice as fast uh, as just using the uh, standard Mac uh, as on the, the Cortex-M3. Um, so these instructions uh, are not directly integrated into the compiler. Uh, so when we want to use them, we have to hand code them with intrinsics. Okay, so that makes things slightly more awkward to do. Uh, but the uh, CMSYS DSP library, uh, if we're building code for the M4 or M7, uh, will automatically optimize the code for the SIMMED instructions. Uh, so again, um, the, the, the library will provide us the, the most efficient code uh, for the processor that we're using. Uh, also on the M4 and M7, the multiply accumulate unit itself uh, is optimized so that all of the instructions that you can see on the screen at the moment are single cycle. Uh, whereas on the, the Cortex M3, uh, everything that ends in a 64-bit um, uh, result is, is uh, single cycle, but the 64-bit results are, uh, are multi-cycle. So again, the, the multiply accumulate unit is more optimized on the, the M4 and the M7. Uh, the latest processor from ARM, the Cortex M7, um, basically has a number of, of optimizations to again increase its overall uh, processing performance. So architecturally um, it has a six stage pipeline which is arranged as uh, two uh, three stage dual issue pipelines uh, so we can uh, process load store instructions and maths instructions in parallel. Okay, so this is really up to the compiler vendors to take advantage of, uh, but in an ideal situation, uh, we have a, a degree of parallelism now, now built into the, the, the processor. Uh, on top of the pipeline, we have another uh, unit, which is called the branch target address cache. Um, so this uh, is a step towards uh, zero overhead loops. So where we're doing looping, uh, the uh, target addresses are, are cached, um, so this minimizes the intrusion of um, uh, conditional branching within the loop instruction. So this is one area where general purpose architectures uh, have a disadvantage compared to a dedicated DSP processor. A uh, dedicated DSP uh, can do zero overhead loops in hardware, so you can tell it to execute a chunk of code uh, and there's no overhead to support that looping. So with the M7, uh, although the, our marketing literature really says zero overhead loops, that's not kind of strictly true. Uh, what we have is this uh, address caching, uh, which is a, a, an improvement or minimizes the impact of the, the loop overhead. So it's a kind of a, a step in the right type direction. Uh, also on the M7, we have a more complicated memory architecture. And within the M7, there are two memory regions uh, called tightly coupled memories. So we have one for data, one for instructions, and these are coupled to the processor as zero weight state memory. So again, uh, these can be up to 64K in size. So these are the ideal places to put our DSP data and algorithms so we can run as fast as possible. So again, uh, on the M7, uh, we can uh, optimize our, uh, our instruction and data to run as quickly as possible. 
So here the advantages of the Cortex-M4 uh, has hardware floating point, SIMD instructions, and then when we move on to the Cortex-M7, uh, we have this uh, dual issue pipeline, uh, so we can do load and store and mass instructions in parallel, and uh, we have, a, say, a move towards or an improved looping uh, architecture, so we have a step towards this zero overhead looping. Uh, so Cortex-M7 uh, gives us some quite big performance boosts over the Cortex-M4. And also currently manufacturers are moving from 90 nanometer to 45 nanometer um, feature sizes, uh, which again is squaring up the number of gates available, uh, but is also pushing the uh, performance level of these devices. So Cortex-M7s are now running at about 400 megahertz. Uh, Cortex M4s are about uh, just over 200 megahertz, so uh, we have a cycle for cycle performance boost, uh, but also a lot more headroom uh, in um, uh, the overall processor speed. So to have a look in more detail at the, uh, the DSP library, uh, we can have a look uh, at the, the number formats that are used, uh, both for float and also integer representation. And then we can have a look at how we can actually use the DSP library, both for bare metal uh, and also if we're using a, a small footprint RTOS as well. So as we've mentioned, uh, within the, um, uh, the DSP library, we have the opportunity to use floating point. Uh, normally, I think in a lot of embed small embedded applications, we probably tend to avoid floats and, and stick to integers. Uh, but it is a more natural choice when we come to uh, DSP algorithms. So again, um, the library is written either to use hardware or software, IEEE 754. And as mentioned, when we select our processor, the tool chain will automatically set up to use a software or hardware library. Now, when we use the integer, it will the library supports 8, 16, uh, or 32 bits, uh, but the number format that is used is called the Q number format. So this is a, um, uh, a fixed point uh, representation of rational numbers. So we're taking an integer and we're splitting it into two portions, one that represents the integer value and then a fixed portion that represents the fractional value. So there are, within the library there are a number of helper functions that help us convert from uh, normal integer representation to Q number format. Uh, and also the Q number is held um, as a two's complement um, for uh, signed values. So we have a slightly different way of looking at integers uh, within the, the DSP library. And converting between the two is fairly straightforward. Uh, we multiply by 2 to the n, where n is the fractional resolution, and then round to the uh, nearest integer. And to convert from Q to float, uh, we uh, cast to a, a float and then multiply by 2 to the minus n. So we divide down effectively. So um, we have a choice between using fixed point and floating point. Um, so again, uh, with the Mac, uh, we can do most of our maths now in, in a single cycle. Uh, if we take advantage of the SIMD instructions, for if we're using 8 or 16-bit values, uh, then we will overall accelerate the performance. We'll sort of double uh, the, the performance of the library. However, we, we face a limitation here uh, that these use the central register file of the Cortex processor. So this limits us to um, 16 32-bit wide registers and three of these are actually reserved uh, for use by the, the compiler. So uh, when we're using integer maths, um, we, we have to be aware of uh, the, the, the amount of space we're taking in the central registers. Uh, floating point, again, if we've got hardware floating point, we have uh, a huge boost in performance. Uh, we don't have the SIMD instructions, uh, 
Um, but the floating point unit actually has more gates than the Cortex M0. So it's quite a large unit and it contains um, 32 floating point registers. So again, this gives us lots of room to hold our, our DSP uh, values. So again, floating point for complex algorithms uh, perhaps makes more sen sensible choice. So again, as a guidelines, uh, if your data types are rating 16 bits, uh, you probably want to consider using a fixed point implementation. Um, if you're using 32 bits, we can use fixed point for simple algorithms. Uh, if we're doing complex uh, DSP or a number of al algorithms, it may be better to move, move to floating point, particularly um, if we have the hardware floating point unit. So to add the library, as I've said, it's available as source code, which we can download and integrate into the tool chain that we're using. Uh, within the Kyle tools, it's automatically included as part of the uh, CMSIS pack. And again, this pack is maintained by ARM. Uh, so within the runtime environment manager, uh, within uh, the Microvision IDE. We can open the CMSIS section and then add the DSP library by simply checking the DSP box. And then this will be added to our project as uh, part of the CMSIS standards. Uh, we then simply include the header file within our code and we can start to access all of the algorithms that are within the DSP library. Now the DSP library itself um, uses a, a method called block processing. Uh, it's possible to run uh, the DSP algorithms and send them a single sample at a time. Um, so then we, we process each sample as it's produced and then pass the, the result back to, to be used by the, the rest of our code. However, uh, be, with um, uh, the DSP library, uh, we can specify that we want to process a, a block or a chunk of data at a time. So we can process 32, 64, 128, 256 uh, samples uh, with one part of the algorithm. Uh, so this, the reason that we want to do this is that it allows us to optimize the underlying DSP algorithms uh, to use a number of coding uh, uh, tricks, if you like, uh, such as loop unrolling, uh, super loop unrolling, to minimize the, the number of loops that the processor has to do. And this improves the performance of the algorithm running on a, a general purpose architecture uh, like the Cortex processors. Um, so within the, uh, the Cortex uh, DSP library, uh, we need to, to build our algorithms to, to process blocks of data. So within the uh, actual API, there are a number of conversion routines that we can use, and we'll see these in use in a bit. So we can convert from floating point uh, to any of the queue numbers and queue numbers to, to float. Okay, so um, again, uh, when we're working with raw data, it's easy to uh, prepare it or pre-process it to pass over to the, uh, the DSP algorithm. And in general, the, um, the structure of the APIs uh, is simply that we'll have an initializing al uh, function for the particular algorithm that we're using. Uh, this creates an instance of the, uh, the algorithm and we can pass the, uh, any setup functions, uh, some, any state memory that it needs to use, or in this case, the filter coefficients as well. And uh, we have a, an initializing function for each of the different data types. And then for each of the actual algorithm APIs, uh, we have um, a safe function uh, which will do saturation or, or bounds checking so that um, we won't go over or, or under range in our DSP algorithm. Again, this will be vitally important if we're doing a, a control loop. Or there is a fast version um, which doesn't do any range checking. So it run a bit quicker, uh, but it's up to you to make sure the, the, data is, the applied data is, uh, is correct. 
Now, when we implement uh, w with bare metal, um, it's likely that we'll, we'll use a, a sort of ping pong or dual buffer type of method uh, where we're uh, recording data into one buffer and then the DSP algorithm is processing a second buffer which is already full of data. And then we have a similar arrangement on the output where we may be feeding data to a DAC. So we're just ping-ponging between the two buffers. And this works fine for a fairly simple uh, code, but as a, an application builds and you have more interrupts, uh, you may have communication stacks running, then it sometimes gets difficult to guarantee the, the latency of processing these buffers. Uh, or again, uh, strange bugs start to, to creep in as well. So I want to have a look at how we can implement a similar technique within a real-time operating system that gives us greater visibility and greater control to ensure that we meet our DSB processing deadlines. So within a, an RTOS, um, the CMSIS RTOS, we have a, um, uh, an object called a, a memory pool where we can create a number of uh, buffers. So these will be our buffers that we record our blocks of data into to pass to the, uh, the DSP algorithm. So in this case we have uh, two buffers, uh, one which we're filling with data from the interrupt and uh, then we have a buffer which is full of data which we are passing to the DSP algorithm. And then we have a similar arrangement on the output so that we, once we've processed the data, it will be fed into a memory block and then a block which is full of processed data, pardon me, <coughs> uh, will be feeding data to the, the output DAC. And then the DSP algorithm itself is running in an RTOS thread. And this thread can be given a priority so that when it's ready to run, i.e. there's some data ready to process, it will preempt the other threads, the event-driven threads on the system, process the data, and then go back to sleep and allow the event-driven code to, to resume processing. So here we can guarantee that the real-time code is going to execute, process the data as needed by the system. And again, we'll see some code and then have a look at how the debug tools can uh, validate this. So here we have the code for the background thread. So this is the uh, SIGMOD function. And it's running as an RTOS thread, so it has a, uh, a for loop that's running forever. And here the first line of code in that loop is waiting on an event flag. So this, uh, if this flag hasn't been set by the interrupt room routine, this will cause the, uh, the thread to suspend itself and stop processing. So this allows the other parts of the system to work. Uh, so uh, other threads, uh, communication stacks, um, GUIs, uh, what, what have you. When that thread has been signaled, um, the thread will wake up and here we're now passing the block of data that's been prepared by the interrupt routine into the filter function. And then once that data has been processed, uh, we'll get a block of data out uh, that we're going to signal back to the interrupt thread. So the thread wakes up uh, and at the bottom uh, we can see the actual call where we're calling the FIR filter, we're calling its instance, uh, we're passing it the data, passing a pointer to the return data and also setting the size of the data that we go, a block of data that we're going to process. Once we process the data, uh, we free the buffer uh, that we've just processed back to the memory pool. So underneath the RTOS is maintaining and managing these buffers for us. Um, and then uh, we set up um, the next buffer and we, uh, sorry, we set up the processed data for the interrupt routine and we signal that the interrupt routine, that there's data, output data are ready to process. And then finally we allocate the next buffer uh, that's going to receive data in to be processed by the uh, DSP algorithm. 
So fairly simple high level lines of code that we're stalling the function. Once we have data, we're processing it. We're signaling that this back that there's output data ready to the interrupt routine. Uh, and then we're preparing to receive the next block of data. And then in the interrupt routine, so this is running off of a timer interrupt that's running at the uh, sample rate that we require. So this is reading initially the ADC and it's um, uh, scaling it and casting it to a float. We then convert that float to a Q31 number and copy it into the uh, buffer that ultimately we're going to pass to the background thread. So we're slowly filling that data up until it reaches the block size of data that we're going to pass to our background thread. Uh, we then uh, set the signal flag so that the background thread will wake up and process that data and then we allocate a fresh block of data uh, to start record, uh, sorry, a fresh buffer so that we can start recording the ADC data uh, into a new buffer. And then this interrupt routine is two halves. So this top half is processing the ADC. And here on the bottom half, we are examining the flags to see if there is a, a set of DAC data ready to write out to the, the DAC. So here we're not blocking at all, we're just examining the state of the flags. If we now have a fresh block of data, we're um, scaling that, uh, we're converting that data back to a float and scaling it, casting it to a int32 and writing it to the DAC. So again, we now write out all the samples uh, that are in that block of data. Once uh, we've uh, f uh, read out all of the data from that block, uh, we release the buffer back to the memory pool and uh, set the index back to zero. So we'll go back to waiting and checking for the next block of data. So underneath we have the operating system managing the buffers for us and we're using the operating system to signal between the interrupt and the background thread. And the background thread is processing and running all of the DSP data. And provided that thread runs and produces the data um, before the uh, existing block of data has been written out to the DAC, we will always get continuous <coughs> uh, real-time performance. And in the development tools, we can actually monitor this um, so we can guarantee uh, that we're always going to meet that deadline. So when we have the operating system, uh, we can visualize the uh, execution of all of the threads within the debugger. So here uh, we can see the runtime of the SIGMOD thread. Um, so the blue box here shows us the, the total runtime and the gap between um, the, the execution of the blocks shows us the spare time that we have <coughs> uh, to calculate the DSP algorithm. Okay. Oh, sorry, the spare time that's left over once we've finished running the DSP algorithm. So that is the time that's left for the event-driven code in the rest of the system um, to, to execute. So whenever the, uh, uh, the SIGMOD thread is signaled, it will start executing. Uh, when it has processed, it will stop executing and it will signal the timer interrupt and then it will deschedule itself and any other thread in the system is then free to run. So here we're successfully mixing real-time code and event-driven code in the one system. We can visualize it and guarantee that the real-time code is always going to meet its deadlines. One disadvantage of this system uh, is introduced by this, this block processing method. The problem here is that there's no output data until the first block of data has been processed. So there's a latency from when we start sampling the signal to when we start outputting the data. And that will be um, a multiple of the block size. 
So providing our system can live with that, then this uh, system is okay. Or by decreasing the block size, uh, we can start to minimize that latency. But then the DSP algorithm runs more frequency, frequently and actually uses more processing time. So again, it's a, it's a trade-off between uh, the resolution and um, uh, the minimal delay that we need uh, and the impact of the DSP algorithm on the system. Uh, we can also record our DSP, our sample data, directly into the debugger as well. So with the Cortex um, uh, debug architecture, uh, we can sample the uh, peripheral registers in real time non-intrusively. So at the bottom of the screen here, uh, we can look at the input wave that's coming from the ADC. And we can also use this screen a little creatively as well. Um, so if we create a simple function uh, called draw bins, and we have two volatile uh, variables, FFT and complex magnitude, uh, we can write the, complex, the output of, um, uh, for example, an FFT, so the, the uh, process bins of an FFT algorithm, and we can write those, copy them out to these variables. And then by adding those variables to the uh, logic analyzer, we effectively are drawing their contents out into the debugger. So while we're looking at the uh, time domain for the wave, uh, we can look at the frequency domain for the output of the FFT function. And if we also plot the index i by moving the cursor, um, the the value for i will tell us the bin number that we're looking at. So here we can see some peaks um, that are uh, introduced uh, in the output of the FFT. And if we move the cursor over that peak, we can read the value of i, and that will tell us the bin number um, that that value is in. So we're creating sort of a poor man's logic analyzer. But it's a quick and easy way to see exactly what's happening in our, our DSP algorithm. Um, there's some also some useful tools, uh, some commercial uh, DSP filter tools. Uh, it's a company called iowegion.com. Uh, so they make uh, filter design tools. And a similar company, MDS, uh, make a, a similar set of filter design tools. So again, if you're looking at uh, developing FFT, uh, sorry, um, FIR or IAR filters, um, there are some uh, tools that you, quite affordable tools that you can download um, and um, uh, design, uh, develop the uh, coefficients for your filters. Uh, if you have MATLAB, uh, then this is uh, a very useful package for numerical computing. Uh, but there's also a useful tool called Scilab uh, that you can download, and this is an open source uh, version of MATLAB uh, that provides similar functionality. Um, so if you are doing some DSP algorithms, you can design filters and algorithms within Scilab um, with a, a bit of practice. It's, it's useful, uh, not quite as polished as MathWorks, but then we have the advantage that it's open source and free to use. So it's, it's certainly worth a look uh, if you're experimenting with this area. Uh, there are a number of examples uh, that are uh, available uh, in the uh, CMSIS pack as well. Uh, they're a little hidden, but if you open up the pack installer within the Kyle tools, and uh, in the devices tab, if you select ARM, and then examples, uh, there is a, a set of uh, DSP examples that are provided uh, to run on um, in simulation uh, on the various different Cortex processors. So these are quite useful for benchmarking uh, and also seeing uh, exactly how the API is, is used. So a good starting point if you're looking to, to use the library. Uh, also on the Kyle website, there's a very good application note uh, that describes uh, how to use the, uh, the RTOS and uh, CMSIS DSP library in detail. So if you want to, to have a look at the, uh, the example that we looked at earlier and go over it in more detail, uh, then the app note and the associated download uh, will allow you to do that. 
Uh, this also runs in simulation as well, and it runs on, I think it's uh, an LPC 1768 uh, that also simulates the ADC and the DAC. So we can see the complete uh, simulation running from input to output. So it's, it's a, a useful um, uh, app note to look at. Um, at the end of this presentation, we'll send you an email with links to the presentation uh, and also to a download of a workshop that we did uh, with ST last year. So this runs on the Cortex-M7. Uh, so there's a number of hands-on uh, worksheets and worked examples uh, that show you how to uh, build code for the M7. And we also look at um, using the CMSIS uh, DSP library for the FFT and FIR functions as well. So this steps you through um, from scratch to, uh, to build up applications using uh, the DSP library. Uh, a few useful books to, to, to finish off with today. Um, uh, Digital Signal Processing uh, by uh, Stephen Smith um, is very useful, very good at uh, introducing the uh, DSP concepts. Um, there's a similar, um, uh, probably I think I prefer the, um, the second book, Understanding Digital Signal Processing. Uh, it has a, a more mathematical approach and gives you, I think, a, a stronger understanding. Uh, but both are, um, I think, top-selling books on Amazon, so uh, worth having a look at both. Uh, there's also a uh, free open source book that you can download, or there's a, a commercial print copy uh, called Think DSP from Alan B. Downey as well. So again, a, a search for any of those titles will, will take you to their web pages. But all of them are, are certainly worth a look uh, if you uh, haven't done any uh, DSP before. So I'd like to thank you for joining us today. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, uh, please raise them and uh, we'll come back to you by email later today.